Um, you know, we've been uh, defining algebra in all the uh, evenings that we've been having together. But somebody just asked me what algebra means and why we've called this club algebra. And it's a good way to actually frame the next conversation because the beautiful thing that algebra means is the science of restoration and balance. Uh, it also means the coming together of broken parts. And as we are discussing worlds falling apart, uh, it's nice to remember that there is a principle of restoration and balance in, in the universe. Uh, and in, that, that's a good way to enter the next session, which again is about power and pushbacks. It's a befitting fact of history that today here we are, a disparate people, speaking in English and about to bitterly and severely critique the English. Uh, Shashi Tharoor, as you know, his union, uh, Oxford Union debate uh, lecture went viral. In many ways, it was surprising, like Shashi himself says, because we should have known all this about our own history. But I've just spent a couple of days reading his book, and I have to say the era of darkness is a real eye-opener. No matter what we think we know about our history, it's true that the history books did not teach us what Shashi has put together in his book. And it really is not just a recognition and a coming to terms with our past. It has a lot of keys to why we are the kind of people we are today, why we have the kind of polity that we have today. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to introduce Shashi much further. We all know him. He is a diplomat, a politician. But most of all, he's again that rare being that the world is rejecting more and more a polymath and an articulate man. For that fact, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shashi Tharoor. <laughs> Shashi, as I said, you know, the assumption is that most people will know uh, that the British era was not a good time for India. But your book is absolutely shocking, actually. And it's wonderful because you've picked it up like a true debater. Uh, you've picked all the points on which the British Empire congratulated itself. And you have dismantled that. But the most unusual aspect of uh, what you're bringing home to us now is how Britain destroyed India industrially. I think that's a story that many Indians don't know. So can we start with that? Sure. Uh, what are the top three ways that India broke, uh, that Britain broke India's uh, industrial spine? Okay, but let me just start by saying in the introduction you said that uh, we're going to be bitterly and severely criticizing the British, the English. And I want to assure you, severely yes, bitterly no. I, there's no place for bitterness in all this. Thank you for there that. There is a sort of quiet <laughs> seething anger, but there's no bitterness. <laughs> so that's another rare commodity, uh, graciousness in public life. Wow, oh, you're too kind, Shoma. <laughs> Listen, no, the point is that um, uh, Shoma asked about the deindustrialization that accompanied the um, British Empire in India, and the fact is that it was across the board. The three examples she asked for, I would pick textiles, steel, and shipbuilding. Textiles are probably the one that most of us already knew. Uh, India was the world's leading exporter of textiles, the world's best producer of cotton cloth and products. In fact, in the 16th and 17th centuries, there are recorded instances from England of British shops taking shoddy made in Britain goods and trying to pass them off as made in India because made in India was such a prestige uh, mark of quality of, of, our, of, our, of our textiles. And people were trying to sell lace and linen and so on as made in India when they were actually made there. When the British came, they not only attacked this industry deliberately, they smashed the looms of the weavers. I mean, the Dhaka gauzes, which were as fine as woven air, it was said, the muslins and cottons, which were really unreplicable. Nobody else did them so well. They smashed the looms, and at least one incident, possibly many more, but one that was recorded by a Dutch contemporary, they actually cut the thumbs of the weavers so they could not actually weave the cloth again. They then imposed swinging taxes and tariffs on Indian cloth to be exported from India. And they, of course, since they controlled the territory and the ports, they had no tariffs or taxes or duties on their goods and their cloth coming into India. 
and especially as industrialization came and machines came, they swamped India with their goods and destroyed our textile industry. Steel was an eye-opener for me too. I didn't realize that we had invented steel. The world's first steel was made in India, and the technology was so fine that when the Arabs took it from us in the 7th century, they created what became the world-famous Damascus steel using Indian technology. It was invented in the south, and so the word for Indian steel was in Kannada, ukku steel, and ukka could not be pronounced by Europeans, so they said wuk and woods, and finally became wood steel, which looks vaguely Germanic. So people assumed that was a European word. It wasn't. It was merely a clumsy transliteration of, of uka. And our steel was so good and so famous that even as late as when the British came to India and they would shoot the Indian enemy, the British soldiers would dismount from their horses and steal the swords of the Indians because the Indian swords were so much superior to any sword that could be made in Europe because the steel was so much better than any European steel. And what did the British do? They destroyed this industry, uh, did not allow India to manufacture any more steel. Then, of course, they had the British steel industry coming up through modern industrial techniques in the middle of the 19th century. And when an Indian finally wanted to make a modern steel plant, Jamshedjiti Tata, the British put up so many obstacles in its path uh, trying to prevent it completely, that in fact, in the end, Jamshedji Tata passed away before his, his steel plant could come on stream, but he'd finally got all the hurdles overcome, started building what became uh, the Tata Iron and Steel Company in Jamshedpur. Uh, his son was the one who actually then first produced first steel. What was interesting is, in Tata's life, lifetime, a very senior British official, the chairman of the railway board at that time, sneered that he would personally eat every ounce of steel that an Indian was capable of producing. And I've written that, of course, I only regret that he didn't live long enough to see the descendants of that same Jamshedji Tata acquire the remnants of British steel when they bought Chorus <laughs> about a decade ago. Um, and the third example is shipbuilding. Shipbuilding, again, was a major industry in India, both in Bengal and in the south. Um, our ships were universally regarded as the most finely crafted ships in the world. Also, the Indian wood, which is basically teak and mahogany, lasted much longer than British pine and fir, with the result that Indian ships had an average lifespan of 20 to 25 years. Uh, these are the days of wooden ships, obviously. And the British ships um, were only six or seven years. So when the British first conquered India, particularly Bengal, they had ships made in India for their own use because our shipwork, our craftsmen, everything, including the brass work on the ships, everything was so much superior to the quality available elsewhere. But then, of course, the backlash came. The British said, hey, we need to protect our own shipping. And so they started passing legislation that made it impossible for Indian-made ships to actually be used profitably by companies. In other words, uh, for example, the most profitable routes were to go to China pick up tea, sail to London, sell the tea, pick up British goods and come back to India. What they basically did was they prevented Indian ships from, from doing the lucrative um, uh, China to India route or the China to London and London to India routes. So essentially all these ships could do was local traffic and only British ships could do the rest. So that, that too then became uh, a destroyed industry. And there's some very, very good, interesting scholarship. One of the things, Shoma, that I did in researching this book is read some of the scholarly articles that have come out in very recent years from some of the better universities in India, in England, and in America. And there's some good work that reveals in great detail with facts and figures how all this used to work. So there's no question that in these three examples, the British absolutely destroyed Indian industry. In fact, Shashi, uh, there's a statistic now that perhaps many of you are familiar with that India apparently had 23% of the world's GDP when the British came to India. And by the time they left in 1947, we only accounted for 3% of the GDP. And Britain, when it came to India, accounted for only 0.3% of the world's GDP. And of course, by the time they left or at its absolute uh, uh, pinnacle, uh, it was the empire on which the sun never set. 10% so, of global GDP by 1947, by so, 1940. So Shashi, you know, uh, as I said, that idea that India was ever industrial uh, 
is something that has been erased from our mind. There's also another uh, pretty much accepted notion of India, possibly passed on by the British to us, which is that we don't have a scientific temper, and that indeed India would never have been an industrial nation if at all today we dream of manufacturing things, it's because the British colonized us. Is that a true premise? Absolutely not. First of all, on those figures and statistics you gave, which are also in the book, um, I do want to point out very simply, the British came to what was one of the richest countries in the world, conquered it, looted it, drained its resources, and left it as one of the poorest countries in the world. That's a very stark fact that the evidence is incontrovertible about. And so you can look at the details in my book, but the fact is that that is exactly what the British did for 200 years. And when they talk about, um, oh, the, some of the apologists say, look, you just, you know, you guys missed the bus on industrialization. We got the Industrial Revolution. You chaps were still into handlooms and weaving and all of the stuff. So you missed it. Why are you blaming us? That's the, the argument that Shoma is really asking about. And also that congenitally Indians don't have a scientific temper. Exactly. So the first answer is, of course, that, um, that you know, if we missed the bus, it was because you threw us under its wheels. If you look at the various handicaps they saddled India with, from their duties and tariffs and restrictive laws and the discriminatory policies against Indian industry, obviously we didn't stand much of a chance. Even later when we started manufacturing steel, the British imposed their standards, the so-called BSSS, the British Standard Specification Steel, which is not what the bulk of the world wanted. Uh, Tata was willing to manufacture international standard specification steel and explore his own international markets. The British wouldn't let him. So, you know, at every level, there were so many attempts made to restrict us. But coming back to the scientific temper, what's often forgotten, and in fact, liberals like Shoma and me are sometimes guilty of sneering a lot at the BJP acolytes who, um, who go on about the, the ancient glories of, of India. But because they sort of have these fanciful notions of jet aircraft and satellite spaceships and so on in the Vedic era, uh, and we can legitimately laugh at them, we shouldn't dismiss the actual facts of ancient Indian science. There is absolutely no doubt that our scientific temper was the leading scientific temper in the world. That um, Aryabhatta, his deductions in the seventh century, anticipated those of Galileo and Kepler and even Newton by centuries. That gravity had been anticipated in our ancient texts before the apple fell on Newton's head, not just before, but several centuries before, that the mathematics uh, of, of India was so advanced that even the founder of algebra, not Shoma Chaudhary, but Al-Khwarizmi in, in, in the Arab world, actually gave entire credit for algebra to the unknown ancient Indian mathematicians who had invented it. It got known in the world because of Arab mathematicians, which is why to this day, our numbers are known in the West as Arabic numerals. The Arabs themselves admit they got them from us. So we were the leading scientific nation of the age, uh, uh, not just of any age, but for a good thousand years. And we were also uh, the country that in many ways uh, can be credited with the first recorded inventions of a number of scientific things, including surgery. Shushruta was the world's first surgeon. His principles were the principles of Hippocrates, and his tools have been found. There's no question that plastic surgery was being practiced as evidence of the world's first rhinoplasty operations were done in ancient India by Shushruta. Now, we forget all of this because, as Shoma says, the British have managed to convince us that we owe whatever little scientific accomplishment we have today to them. After all, it said the only Indian to win a Nobel Prize in the sciences, C. V. Raman, won it um, in the British-run University of Calcutta, etc. Actually, um, the fact is that if it weren't for British rule, God knows how much more could have been accomplished if we, so Indian science had been able to continue its normal course. But the fact is, history does get in the way. And, you know, we can't wish away the fact that we did have this rule, and therefore, uh, we now have to recapture that old scientific glory. We are the society, the culture, the civilization, that invented the zero, without which modern mathematics would be impossible. If you look at the Roman numbers, it becomes absurd beyond the point to talk about any large concepts, because you have to write a string of Latin letters, right? And of course, doing calculations was near impossible. It was the invention of the zero, the creation of the decimal system by Indians, uh, 
that gave us modern mathematics today. That is, is, is India, the country that invented the zero, and sometimes it feels today that all we invent is zero. We've <laughs> got to change that. So, uh, Shashi, you know, I'd like to uh, go over some more of the landscape of pain that the British uh, bequeathed to us before we begin to look at its implications in, uh, you know, who we are today. So, can we speak about that other great uh, fracture in India, which is agriculture? You know, in your book, you've spoken of the co uh, colonial holocaust, the fact that almost 35 million people died in a famine. Uh, can you again share with us, uh, uh, you know, today that what was the British doing to create that kind of uh, privation uh, yeah. in the countryside? 35 million is in all the famines of 200 years of British rule, but that's a direct result of British policy. These 35 million Indians died totally unnecessary deaths because of British policy. And that's something we forget. We got so used to thinking that Indians are, you know, dying of famine. There must be something wrong with us. Nobody had died of famine until the British came. Because in India, we had a culture of help. Right from the very start, in fact, if you go back to agricultural taxation, which I've described in the book, in the old days, before the British came, our taxation was very light. No Maharaja ever taxed more than 15% of the crop. And in fact, the Indian culture being what it was, if, for example, there was a drought that year, tax was not, not levied, if peasant had a a wedding in the family, a daughter to get married, a serious sickness, whatever, tax was reduced or not charged. That was the Indian way. And, of course, the tiller essentially controlled the land. There were rent collectors and zamindars. The Muslims named a few of these characters. But, by and large, the land was owned by the person tilling it. The British came and they imposed the most criminal exactions on Indians. The peasants were charged a minimum of 45% in the lightest regimes, and in many cases, 85% and more, in some cases, the entire crop was the taxation. That those who couldn't pay taxes, taxes were pilloried, scourged, tortured, humiliated in public places, stripped naked, all sorts of things in the most humiliating ways. There were no allowances made for any conditions, drought, famine, weddings, feasts, illnesses, nothing. And the British then decided to replicate the conditions they knew in their country by quote-unquote, land settlement policies that essentially created the zamindars of today, or, or of yesterday, since many of them have now become victims of land reform in modern India, but they created this culture and deprived the tiller of control over his own land. So landlessness and landless agriculture was for the first time created by the British. Agricultural poverty, which had been unknown before the British, was created by the British. There are records... Contemporary records, I read 17th, I mean 18th, 19th century documents of peasants fleeing British lands for princely states where they'd be treated more humanely because of the, of the, the horrendous exactions by the British in the lands under the company, East India Company's control. And on top of that, what did they do? They had this incredible policy towards famine, which was that if famine came, they had an absolute injunction, you could not help the victims of famine. You could not help the victims of famine for three sound reasons as they saw it. Number one, free trade principles. Adam Smith, let the invisible hand of the market prevail. You should not help anyone. The market will take care of people. If it doesn't, too bad. Second, Malthusian population beliefs, which are very popular in the 19th century, which is that if the land is unable to sustain the population upon it, people must be allowed to die so that the population figures can reach a reasonable equilibrium. And the third principle was typically British and Victorian. Napoleon had called them a nation of shopkeepers, which is financial prudence. Do not spend money you haven't budgeted for. And since no one budgeted for famine relief, charity was impermissible. The result, and this is, by the way, not only in India. The British followed the same policy in Ireland, which is why there were so many deaths during the Irish potato blight and why so many Irish fled to America in the 1840s was because of British policy. And the same policy is what they tried in India. But in India, it was even worse, because unlike Ireland, they grew grain in India that they wanted to export to England. So from drought-affected areas, they would harvest the grain and ship it off to England while people were dying in the very fields where the grain was being harvested. It's, it seems unbelievable today, but this is all documented. This is all available facts. In fact, what changed... Dadabai Naroji, who was an Anglophile till then, 
into the the passionate crusader for Indian uh, 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 for justice to India that he became was seeing and reading accounts of the Orissa famine of 1866 in which two or three million people died while the British were exporting grain from Orissa to England and as late as the 1880s and 1890s you have recorded instances where kind-hearted English people trying to help victims of, of drought or famine or suffering were told that if they continued helping they would be arrested or they would be deported back to England that was the kind of policy the British followed so, so 35 million people lost their lives because of this policy uh, in fact, uh, Shashi, you also remind us that right up till 1930s, I mean, when that terrible Bengal famine was on, that Winston Churchill, in fact, again insisted that millions of tons of grain be shipped away to merely stock the army, uh, you know, coffers. In, in, in Europe, I mean, the, the Bengal famine, I mean, it always boils my blood when I hear of Winston Churchill being hailed by the British as some sort of democratic hero. He, to my mind, there's very little to choose between Churchill's record in office and and those of Stalin, Mao, Hitler and the other great genocidal rulers of the of the 20th century. This fellow during the Great Bengal Famine it was his decision that instead of grain being released to feed starving Bengalis were literally dropping like fleas. Three to four million people died in the Great Bengal Famine of 43-44 that those stocks would actually be shipped to increase buffer stops in Europe particularly in Greece and Churchill justified it by saying that the lives of any way underfed Bengalis are worth much less than that of sturdy Tommies, quote unquote. Um, that these Hindus can afford to die, they breed like rabbits anyway, quote unquote. Uh, and when a conscience stricken British official sent up a file to London pointing out the consequences of these policies. By the way, there were ships laden with grain from Australia that were sailing past Calcutta and were not allowed to unload their grain while people were dying because uh, of British policy. So when uh, a file was sent to the Prime Minister in London that this was the consequence of British policy, Churchill wrote in the margin, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? That was all he could write. So this is the kind of man being hailed as a great democrat and hero. His racism and contempt and indifference to Indian lives uh, is of a power. With, and if you look at the number of people who died because of British indifference and, 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 and cruelty during these, these famines, which I've enumerated in the book, um, they actually exceed the toll of these great genocides, more than the great collective disaster of, of Ukraine under Stalin, more than the great leap forward in the cultural revolution of Mao, more even than the Jews gassed in the gas chambers by Hitler. Uh, this is what the British uh, did during their time uh, in India. So Shashi, you know, as I said, we'll, we'll come back to how all of this affected deeply the Indian psyche, you know, and the kind of self-hatred or self-disgust uh, that it created in the society and which we're still, basically, we're still unlearning that about ourselves. But before that, if we can again go on to some more of the pillars of British rule in India, there is a sense that Britain brought political unity to India that before that we were just a disparate lot of fighting kingdoms, feudal, illiterate, uneducated, that's the idea we have of ourselves. Would you accept that even if it is in response to colonial rule, that that is what finally brought political unity to the idea of India, that India was born out of the British loin? No, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, first of all, the idea of a common civilization has literally always existed. The Vedas speak of Bharat Varsh as a land from the Himalayas to the oceans. That civilizational idea was widespread throughout, contempt throughout India at all times. And the yearning for political unity was sought to be fulfilled by a succession of empires. Chandragupta Maurya and Ashoka, you all know, the Guptas in the north, the Vijayanagar Empire in the south, and of course, most successful of all, the Mughals who occupied essentially most of what's today, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all the way down to about the last tip of the peninsula, which they couldn't conquer. But what was the constraint was, of course, in those days, the limitations of communications, travel, how far can you reach with the means of communication available to you in those days. But the yearning was always there. The civilizational space is very clear. Shankaracharya, Adi Shankara, 
travel from my state of Kerala all the way up to Kashmir and established his mutt, went to Dwarka, went to Puri. Uh, and his, his um, uh, peregrinations are merely one part of what the Harvard scholar Diana Eck calls the sacred geography of India, where pilgrims always had a common vision of the, the shape of the civilization to which they and their faith belonged. And it wasn't just a Hindu thing. Maulana Azad has written about how Indian Muslims going on the Hajj were greeted by Arabs and by other Muslims from elsewhere in the world as Hindi. Whether they were Pathans or Tamils didn't matter. They were from a recognizable civilizational space called Hind or India. So for both people outside and people inside, there was this common idea. And that's why I, I've written in 20 years ago in my book, India from Midnight to the Millennium, how when Italy was created out of a collection of principalities and statelets in the 19th century, an Italian nationalist memorably wrote, we have created Italy, now all we need to do is to create Italians. And the truth is that no Indian nationalist would ever have said such a thing. Because even though the great sort of articulate nationalists of the mid 20th century, Jawaharlal Nehru, would tell you that India and Indians had always existed well before the nationalist movement gave a contemporary political expression to these yearnings. So I have no doubt that given modern communications, whether or not we'd had the British, unity would have come because at every stage, people were trying to create that unity on the ground. When the British came, what are the process they interrupted? The Marathas were sweeping across much of peninsula and northern India. In fact, the Mughal emperor was de facto a hostage of the Marathas. They'd reached the gates of Delhi. They felt it didn't make sense to try and conquer Delhi. It was best to tell the king, you know, the more or less the way the Pakistani generals tell their civilian governments, you do what we tell you, just don't do anything we don't like, and you can stay as the king. And that's essentially what, um, what the Mughal emperor was doing on Maratha sufferance. You could well imagine a situation where the Marathas or someone else like them essentially spread over most of the country. That, of course, they would have left local satraps and local princes running their own local principalities. And eventually, we would have evolved into something like a constitutional monarchy. There are three models I'll quickly offer you. One is Japan, which did exactly this, modernized under the Meijis um, from 1868 onwards, and indeed became a very prosperous and successful Asian power. The other is Thailand, which again retained the monarchy and allegiance to it, but real power was held by civilian governments underneath the monarch, uh, who, which varied. Some were really military rulers, some were other kinds of civilians who were more or less democratic, sometimes less democratic, but they weren't colonized either. And a third example, which was a colonized country, of how this contradiction of all these princes could be managed, would come from Malaysia, where essentially all the sultans, all the princes gather in a chamber and elect a king from amongst themselves. So we could well have seen something like that evolving, because of course all these princes were exposed to the modern world. Some were more enlightened than others, some were more debauched than others. They would have rapidly figured out who amongst them was fit to be the presiding and figure of this, and something could have happened. Now I realize these are counterfactuals. My guess is as good as yours, you could come up with some other theory, that's fine too. But you cannot credit the British with political unity when, in fact, the systematic effort they made was to destroy India's political unity through divide and rule. No, After the 1857 revolt, Elphinstone wrote a famous memo saying, divide et impera was the Roman maxim and it shall be ours. Divide et impera, divide and rule. And they systematically set about creating consciousness of divisions amongst Indians, whether it was caste, whether it was region, whether it was tribe, whether it was language, and above and all, religion, so, which is what led eventually to partition and the so, division of India's political unity. So in fact, uh, Shashi, two questions. One, of course, it would be a good time to remember that Britain also moved from a monarchy to a democracy without anybody colonizing them. So exactly. there's <laughs> nothing to say that we wouldn't have walked that path either. Uh, but you know, Shashi, about uh, this fact that both you and I are libtards is what we are called. Uh, liberals plus bastards uh, become libtards, right? So, uh, seculars. Seculars. So just having an honest moment there, Shashi, listening to you speak, again, is it important to concede uh, to some of, you know, it may be badly articulated, but is the Hindu right correct in speaking of this land as being, you know, again, a civilizational unity? and that all Indian citizens must admit to that to really be Indian citizens. Is there some fairness in that? One question. 
And the other is that uh, when we are repudiating um, British rule and what it did to India, again, is the Hindu right correct in repudiating what mu Muslim rule did to India? And what's the difference in those two nationalisms? Excellent, because that is a question that's worth addressing. Because in fact, when I speak about 200 years of foreign rule, you know that those who are ruling us today speak of 1,200 years of foreign rule. Uh, no less a figure than our prime minister has used that figure in his speech. And this is where my disagreement comes with them, because to my mind, the Muslim rulers who came to India and ruled here, and did initially come from elsewhere, actually stayed and assimilated here. If you accuse them of, of being foreign, they cease being foreign very quickly. By the time of the fourth Mughal emperor, uh, Mughal emperor he was you know, barely 1 16th uh, from, from the Fergana Valley. Each of his four ancestors had married an Indian woman from here. And, and so ultimately the blood had been significantly diluted. You might have had the Mughals inquiring uh, with curiosity from visiting potentates from Central Asia about the graves of their ancestors in the Fergana Valley. But they didn't want to go back there. This was their homeland. You can accuse them of looting India as some of our present rulers do accuse them of. But they spent their loot here. They actually created Indian art, culture, sculpture. They imported artists and musicians and painters and sculptors and architects. And, and what they created, they created for this country. How can we dismiss them as foreigners? Whereas what the British did was exactly the opposite. They took from here. They expropriated revenues. They sent them back. And I've given the figures, which are not just my figures. These are figures going back to the calculations of Dada by Nairoji, of a marvelous Englishman called William Digby, who wrote a book in 1904, 940 pages. I have it all on my Google Drive, uh, calculating the colossal drainage of resources by the British during their rule up to that point. It continued, of course. Um, all of this went to England. Even the salaries, the lavish salaries paid by the Indian taxpayer were repatriated to Britain. They had no commitment to this place. And as you know, they did the minimum necessary to sustain their rule. Even the buildings they built were only built to impress the subjects with the majesty of their presence and the power of their strength in this country. It was not about building anything for the Indian people at any stage. And this is fundamentally the difference between these two. I also would like to argue when you, when you talk about the, are they right? They're right about some things. I mean, I have, for example, become a little unpopular with my fellow libtards, because I do feel that we should be teaching the Mahabharata and the Ramayana to our kids in school, because this is a great cultural product of our civilization that children should be as aware of as they are aware of the Western texts that they become familiar with in their English literature classes in a good English medium school. I think they should be reading Kalidasa uh, and not only Shakespeare. They should certainly be reading Shakespeare. But Kalidasa's work, what little has survived, and I would argue probably from what little we know, maybe all we have is 5 to 10% of Kalidasa's total works. Most of his works have been destroyed. That's our great curse. But what little you can see in competent translations are in no way inferior to the greatest works of, of, of Western literature. Uh, they're just magnificent use of, of language, of imagery, of metaphor, of vocabulary, just fantastic. And, and we don't know that because we study, you know, Shakespeare and Chaucer and then the British writers, and we don't actually know Kalidasa. So these are things where I think perhaps 70 years of secular rule um, by the Macaulay Putras, or Putris like you and me, um, have perhaps failed us. And I think we should have restored that much of civilizational pride. But the big difference, I think, with the present Hindutva lot is they have a very narrow and non-inclusive view of what authentic Indianness is. I regret very much that they would exclude from their imagination or their definition of Indian civilization all the other influences that have come into it, including, of course, the Muslims, particularly the Muslim influences, which they reject uh, utterly. And I think they're wrong to do so. I much prefer that wonderful metaphor of Nehru's when in, in the discovery of India, he wrote of India as a palimpsest. And how many of you know what a palimpsest is? It can be a wall, a mural, a painting, whatever. You write something on the wall or on a piece of paper. And then somebody comes and writes something on top of that without erasing what you've written. And somebody else comes and writes on top of that without erasing what's beneath. And finally, what you have is a series of writings 
all of which are adding on top of what was there before. And that palimpsest is what India is in Nehru's metaphor. To me, it's a lovely metaphor. And I think everyone who has written on that wall deserves to claim a share of the heritage of India. Even the British? <laughs> <laughs> if they stayed behind, they would, yes. Absolutely, but they didn't. Well, Those who stayed are absolutely welcome to lay their claim to it. Well, their voice resides in us as you and I speak to each other. <laughs> That's true. And I do acknowledge in my book there were some individual British in the country, administrators, officials of various sorts, and non-officials as well, who made lasting contributions. Uh, I mean, in, in parts of the, the Godavari Delta, the name of Sir Arthur Cotton is still revered because he essentially rendered all those lands fertile through very creative and affordable engineering, check dams, all sorts of things. Um, and, and there are examples that Jim Corbett has talked about by, by nature lovers. There are many other examples. So there are individuals who made a contribution, but unfortunately, none of them stayed, they left. Uh, in fact, Shashi, I'll uh, come back to uh, some of what the positive legacies could have been. We'll come back to that. One of them being that there is again a sense that it is the British really? that gave us a parliamentary spirit. Uh, or the fact indeed, again, something that perhaps we can't deny, which is that much of the nationalist movement was born out of British education. You know, a lot of the nationalists really learned the idea of freedom and liberty from Britain. And also that there was a very healthy critical tradition coexistent with the Raj, and we've been playing some of the quotes there, where contemporaries were really calling out the British Raj and the East India Company. So are those kind of positive qualities that hopefully we inherited, or did we already have that? We haven't even mentioned the railways, so we'll come to that Yeah, next. so that's why I said that. I just want to hold yeah. on to this question. Okay, we'll come to that. And Let come back to some of the depredations first. You know, we haven't finished describing that. So there is a sense, you said that the Mughals and the Muslims built here. So the British bequeathed the Indian railways to us. That's our sense of it, right? Are we right? Okay, I'm going to come back to your question. It was a very important one about the critical spirit and so on. But on the railways, I really feel Shoma is right to bring it up because we honestly need to address that. It's one thing I get anywhere I go from Indians is, come on, they gave us the railways. No, they did not give us the railways. They built the railways for themselves. It was a gigantic colonial scam. What do I mean? Number one, it was built obviously, to explore and exploit the Indian hinterland, to, ex to get resources from, from the innermost recesses of India, which they couldn't reach before the railways, and extract them, bring them to the port, ship them to England. It was therefore a way of also moving labor cheaply up and down, as well as their troops up and down to control the land better. Purpose is entirely British. But when they built it, they built it in the most cynical way to profit indecently from it, because Indians had to pay for the building of the railways. And Indians paid the highest rates of dividend imaginable, the single most profitable investment available to anyone in England from 1850 to 1870s was the Indian railways because they guaranteed a rate of return that was unavailable anywhere else. So that, as a result, a mile of Indian railway cost nine times what the same mile would have cost in Australia, the US, or Canada when railways were being built at the same time. Only because, as somebody cheerfully said at the time, this is private profit at public risk. The only problem was the private profit was of the British investor, the public risk was of the Indian taxpayer. On top of all that, when they actually built the railways, as I said, they didn't build them for us, but of course, Indians did want to travel on them, so what they do, they created these absolutely disgraceful third-class carriages, which were an abomination even in those times, you know, with these wooden slats that people had to lie on and so on, overcrowded, totally unrelated to any genuine demand, and they charge them the highest passenger rates in the world, whereas the British companies using railways for freight paid the lowest freight rates in the world. On top of that, they administered the railways through such a racist policy that right up to the beginning of the 20th century, every single official, other than the most menial ones, from station masters to ticket collectors, had to be European. It was only when they finally ran out of Europeans by the 1920s or so, they started hiring Anglo-Indians, because that's the closest they could get to the Europeans. Now, this kind of racism and discrimination was built in as well. I give you many more details in my book, but there is absolutely nothing to be given credit for. It's only after independence that India seized upon this instrument of British colonial domination and turned it to our own benefit by, for example, lowering passenger fares so that it became principally a people-moving vehicle, and unfortunately, 
from the point of view of the businessman here, raising freight rates to the point where you all prefer to ship your goods by lorries on our congested roads rather than pay the railway freight rates because they're so high. But that was a reversal of British policy in order to cater to the Indian Ahmadmi. So, so again, the railways are not something we need to be grateful to the British for. As you can see, Shashi is the true demolition man. You know, the, the British are wishing that they never had him educated in Oxford so that he can speak in this accent to denounce them just so well, you know. Wasn't educated in Oxford. <laughs> now, you mentioned... But, but sorry, Shashi. There's just one other lovely thing that, uh, you know, Shashi's book is really, and, and there are books there, and you can buy them and have him sign it. Uh, it truly, it's a jaw-dropper. It's, uh, you know, it's jaw-dropping. There's nothing else to say about it. But there's one fascinating detail that Shashi mentions in the book, which is that India was a society of societies, you know, and that you were negotiating with each other all the time. And when the British came, there was just 4,000 British that were ruling 300 million people through the civil services. And so they came up with the rule book and all individuality, all local context just went out of the window and they just applied the rule. And there were 23-year-olds, mostly uneducated British, who were really adjudicating over us. But that, that thing about the rule book, the one size fits all, reminded me, and I must say that, of what we are going through now, you know? The rule book that completely, uh, the demonetization rule book, which is- It changes every day though. It changes every day, right. It had to be Indianized, you know? Even McDonald's gets Indianized, you know? So, well, we are coming close to that kind of colonial, you know, rule book for how we are running our economy. But um, just to come back to this idea of what the British did to us, uh, Shashi, in terms of our psychology, what about the penal code, the education, the judicial courts? They were really made for a conquered people. And because we inherited it, can you just quickly share with us what was the constructs there? And is that why today we still have a colonial distance between how power operates uh, and, and how people receive that power? Absolutely. And in fact, going, incorporating into that your earlier question, which we'd left hanging for a bit, about the, um, the, how the education system led to Indian nationalism, etc. Et I think it's, it's fair to take this up. First of all, the British had no intention of educating the general mass of Indians. None whatsoever. In fact, the debate was about whether they should educate a thin veneer of Indians to serve their purposes. It was won by what the, the school of thought that is now mainly associated with Macaulay, who in his minute on education basically said you need a small class of sort of interpreters between the rulers and the ruled, between the British and the governed Indians, and that these would be people, as he said, Indians in blood and color, but English in taste and opinions and morals and in intellect. And this group was essentially going to be the collaborators of the British in, in controlling the rest of the Indians. That's all they intended to do. They had absolutely no intention of seeing what actually happened, which was Indians using their English education to imbibe the ideas of the Enlightenment and start demanding these rights and privileges for themselves that the British, of course, boasted about having given themselves and the rest of the Western world. And this is something which, to some degree, you can say, I mean, uh, many of the Hindutva critics of Nehru would say he was the last Englishman left in India and so on. To some degree, it is true in, in, the, in terms of his education. His was very much a mind. He was schooled in Harrow, went to Cambridge. He came out of it very much uh, uh, an English-educated lawyer, even though his sympathies, even from England, were with the extremists in the Indian National Congress, the Tilak movement, and not the moderates led by Gokhale. Nonetheless, I still remember was being struck by the fact that when Nehru, as a young man, was sent by the Indian National Congress, his own father had a role in that decision, to Jallianwala Bagh after the massacre to go and write a report on what had happened and he counted all the bullet holes personally, which is a very moving thing. Whenever I go to Jallianwala Bagh, I look at those bullet holes still in the wall and I imagine young Nehru counting them. But on the way out, he actually shared a first class compartment with a group of British officers, including General Dyer. And he heard General Dyer speaking with sneering contempt of the Indians he'd killed and how easy it was and what a turkey shoot it was and how many more he could have killed and so on. And Nehru's reaction is classic. He said, to me, it was the height of bad form. Now, can you think of a more English way of reacting? You know, he said he was shocked by the way the British spoke. 
the British soldier spoke, it was the height of bad form. Now, that was a very, very English reaction. But the idea that an Indian schooled in these English ways of thinking and expressing could use his mind to attack the very premises of British rule would not have occurred to Macaulay when he came up with it. So, Similarly with the penal code. Yeah. Sorry, I'm Sh taking no, too I, much. Only to, because Shashi, there, I wanted to open it up sure, to the audience. Sure, there excellent questions. Uh, I'll quickly finish on the penal code since you did mention it. Written by Macaulay in 1837, even the British thought, how on earth are we going to apply this to India? So they sat on it for 24 years, for an entire generation, and only enacted it in 1861. So it was actually early Victorian morality and practice. The penal code was applied in a completely racist way. In the entire history of British rule, only four cases show, saw Englishmen being convicted for murdering Indians, whereas they had killed hundreds, hundreds in various situations. For example, a very common form of Indian death during British rule was being kicked by what Punch magazine called the stout British boot. Many Englishmen kicked their Indian servants to death with the boots. And these are all recorded. Again, I'm not making any of this up. But no Englishman other than these four cases, which were egregious cases, was ever convicted. Whereas any Indian who so much as raised a hand against an English person could be convicted, sentenced to penal colonies like the Andamans, could be hanged, shot, blown from the mouths of cannons, all of that. So it was the racist penal code. It also enshrined attitudes which were, as Shoma said, part of conquering a subject people. So you had the sedition law, which was much tougher than the equivalent law in England, and explicitly so. When they passed the new sedition law for India, they said it's because these are a conquered and subjugated people. It's not good enough to give them the sedition law we have in England. Similarly, Section 377, in a culture which for 2,000 years had tolerated all kinds of sexual behaviors and sexual deviance, you can go to Kajuraho and see for yourselves what Indian culture was in terms of tolerance and acceptance of all sorts of human behavior. And then what happens? You have the British coming and imposing the Victorian Moral Code with Section 377. And the result is, of course, that today the party of Hindutva betrays ancient Hindu practice in order to uphold Macaulay's penal code today. That's, that's another example Shesh. of the pernicious legacy of the British rule in our minds. Uh, I'm going to just open this up. There are some excellent questions here, uh, Shashi. I hope you have the time to address a lot of them. So quickly, uh, Uday Punj would like to know that why is it that we have continued to fail in research and uh, innovation for the last hundred years? Is that something, you know, is it because the British dismantled higher uh, centers of learning or why have we not uh, sort of fixed this yet? Well, first of all, the British didn't do anything to create any centers of learning. I mean, there were practically no research institutions. C.V. Raman was an absolute aberration. He was there despite the British, not because of the British. Uh, there is absolutely no question that the principal scientific research institutes, the Tata Institute of Science, was founded by an Indian philanthropist, Tata. Uh, there simply wasn't, uh, I mean, what's now the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, uh, the, the, there simply wasn't any effort made to create uh, research institutions or scientific institutions in India. After independence, the British had reduced us to such poverty that resources were minimal. And of course, uh, there are other flaws we can blame ourselves for, including the incredibly bureaucratic and hierarchical attitude of the of the government establishments, because only government had money. So other than a few private institutions, most Indian researchers worked in stifling conditions. And of course, the three Indian scientists who have won Nobel since independence have all won them in foreign countries and, and under foreign passports. So uh, clearly, there have been deficiencies. And still, you have to concede that whatever little scientific establishment exists in India was created after independence and by Nehru, who managed to pump in whatever resources he could afford into the system, created the IITs with foreign collaboration, and essentially have given us the very talents that have gone off and animated Silicon Valley, where 40% of all the startups in California have included Indians. So there has been something done there which, which we can't completely write off. Believe me, as more resources are coming in, there will be more Indian innovation, I assure you. I was invited in 2011 to inaugurate the India Innovation Center in the University of Toronto in Canada. The Canadians can see that Indian innovation is going to be the wave of the future. But, but it's a measure of how we see ourselves that when a minister is made the Minister of Science and Technology, it's seen as a punishment posting, you know, so. Uh, well, in his case, it was a poor chap was shunted from health, which was much more his thing, <laughs> but still. <laughs> Uh, Ajay Singh would like to know that, he says that while I agree with most of what you've said and written, 
uh, why did Indians allow such a small number of British to rule us? Was there something wrong with us? Sure. I mean, like, let's face it, we are uh, congenitally dividable people. I mean, let's be, let's be quite honest about this. I mean, again, uh, if you like, uh, our history is littered with all of these examples. In every case, from Siraj Dawla being betrayed by Mir Jafar to uh, the betrayal of Tipu Sultan. In fact, uh, if you go to Seringapatnam or Srirangapatnam in Karnataka, you'll actually see how the British were allowed to sneak in under a moat through a gate that still bears the sign, Water Gate. And as the guard said, you know, first Water Gate, Sirangapatnam, second Water Gate, Washington. <laughs> you know, this was, this was India. We, 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 we betrayed each other all the time and often for petty gains. The East India Company's initial success, as I've anatomized in the book, came largely through bribery, through protection rackets, through arm twisting, through mafia, because our people were bribable. We were, unfortunately, willing to give and take money in order to gain our personal advantage. Isn't that why corruption still prevails in our country? Because there's always somebody willing to pay for a shortcut. Does that arise out of the relative morality of Hinduism? That's a question we'll come to. Um, Sharad Sharma has an interesting question saying, if you were to suspend your political affiliations for a moment, would you concede that, uh, would you subscribe to the ruling party's efforts at reviving Hinduism and stoking national pride? You see, I would have absolutely no problem with stoking national pride if it were A, an inclusive national pride, not only for Hindus and not only for some kinds of Hindus. <laughs> Secondly, because I, you know, I'm from the South myself, so this whole Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan has profound limitations from where I come from. Where Hindi, for example... In the epics, you guys were the Asurs. <laughs> You're just an aberration, Shashi. Too fair to be an Asur, but no, otherwise... No, no, no. <laughs> No, the fact is we're all completely mixed up. You know that. And we, I think we all, we've, all had, uh, we've all had various kinds of commingling, far more than we give ourselves credit for. In fact, one of the things that for me too was an eye-opener, but which I've described at length in the book, is the extent to which today's caste system is a legacy of the British. But I'll leave that to you as a teaser for you to read and find out from the book. Um, but the fact is that we were much more fluid uh, in terms of our identities, caste, language, region, everything else. But that's another issue for another time. The truth is that um, if the nationalism were an inclusive one, and secondly, if it were a nationalism that celebrated freedom, including the freedom to dissent, the problem with today's nationalism, or the nationalism that is sought to be propagated by the Bharat Mata Ki Jai types, is a nationalism that number one, excludes too many Indians, and number two, does not permit of legitimate dissent. So if you all, if you only have one view, and it's my way or the highway, then of course many of us have no choice but to be on the highway, even if we have some sympathy with the case for national pride and including civilizational cultural pride. I've often argued with the Hindutva acolytes that I'm a proud Hindu too, except that my interpretation of Hinduism is a polar opposite of yours. I think that people who say, who speak of Hinduism the way in which a British football hooligan you know, yells for his team is being profoundly Un-Hindu is betraying the extraordinary eclecticism of the Hindu faith, which is a religion that actually privileges uncertainty, that is a religion of doubt and questioning. I point out that one of the first verses of the Rig Veda, talking about creation, says, from where does this world come? Who has made it? From whence does this creation exist? Only he in the heaven knows, or maybe even he does not know. Wow. That's in the Rig Veda, right? 1500 BC. We're talking of 3,500 years ago, and if they could express that kind of doubt, this is a perfect religion for people of a questioning temperament, of a willingness to explore, of a willingness to examine other ideas. It is absolutely the wrong religion for the kind of Hindutva movement, which is saying, this is right, this is what you have to do, and everyone else who says anything else is wrong. That's not Hinduism as I understand it. In fact, the great irony is that the Hindu right uh, objects to homosexuality and believes that it's some modern day disease, when indeed homosexuality was very much part of ancient civilizations in India. And Gurcharan Das was here talking about eroticism, and he spoke of that, you know. Um, Shashi, another question that, uh, I'm sorry, just a minute. Someone wanted to ask, um, Ritansh Hans wanted to know, was that, is there anything that the British did well for India? Well, you know, uh, 
This is one legacy I can't do without. Oops. <laughs> well, Dude. so much for that. <laughs> the British got their own back at me. It was, it was, it was, uh, we didn't really drink tea before the British came. Uh, in fact, uh, what happened was really that, um, that uh, the British were actually importing tea from China and uh, they were having lots of troubles, including the fact that the Chinese could raise prices whenever it suited them. There were also disturbances in China. So they tried, they actually sent a secret agent with the improbable name of Robert Fortune to try and smuggle some tea, tea leaves out of China, tea plants out of China and plant them in India. But unfortunately, every one of the saplings he stole and shipped over to India died. So, so it was sheer fluke that a Brit wandering in Assam came across something that looked to him like tea. He boiled it and in fact, uh, not only did he make tea, but he found that the tea made in India for out of Indian leaves was far more palatable to the British housewife, who was the only intended target, uh, uh, because it was only made for export. And the British grew tea in India to ship to England. There was absolutely no intention of selling more than a tiny percentage of the crop and that too only for the British consumer in India. It was only with the Great Depression, I'm talking of the 1930s, when the market collapsed in Britain, people didn't have money to buy luxuries like tea, that the British tea growers in India were obliged to cultivate a domestic market in order to unload their stocks of Indian tea. And that's how Indians started drinking tea. It's much more recent than any of us realize. So even there, you can only give the British half a credit. Half the credit for the plantations and the organized cultivation of tea, but they didn't intend for me to be sitting here drinking it, unless, of course, I was in some tea room in London, which I'm not. <laughs> okay, that, that's kind bell of... Tolls. <laughs> the bell tolls. The uh, bell tolls. Rajan Kalia has one interesting question. Quick answer, Shashi. Is all the money that the British took away from us finally coming back through BPO's VC money and the IT industry? Not all of it, no, because in fact, an Indian journalist did a calculation after my Oxford speech when he said, why is Shashi saying we don't want reparations, we want reparations? And he calculated the astronomical sum of three trillion pounds, which exceeded the entire GDP of Britain. So clearly, it's not something that could be paid. So I'm not sure we're going to get three trillion pounds out of the British for a long time. But still, when I argue with those who uh, like the fellows who broke the Babri Masjid, uh, want to revenge themselves upon history. I always tell them, you can't revenge yourself upon history. because History is its own revenge. And I think I found vindication because when this book came out, two days later, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, landed up in Delhi and then went to Bangalore and Hyderabad and Bombay looking for investment from India into Britain. You see, history is its own revenge. <laughs> That's a wonderful note to end on. I'm, I'm, you know, there's some excellent questions here and I'm thinking the next time we should just start with... Uh, I have the time if you have the time, so go ahead. Well, the audience is hungry and there's a Tuesday to contend with. Is it fine with all of you? A couple more Democracy questions. Democracy at work. <laughs> of course, they can animate it with some Glenn Livet on the stage as well. <laughs> then we can really go. Fine. Uh, well, Ritansh, I'm going to kind of be partial to you and ask a second question from you, which is that, uh, you know, David Cameron came recently and apologized. Do you think we should accept that apology and are there other traditions, you know, so rather than the monetary compensation, uh, are we really owed an apology? We are. Most definitely we are. And I don't think that David Cameron's was actually an apology. Uh, he was speaking almost like a disinterested observer. Oh, this was a shameful thing. I mean, come on. Are you ashamed? You know... Who are you? Why, where is the apology? I don't accept that. That's not an apology at all. I'll give you two examples of a real apology for historical wrongs. One is when Willy Brandt, the Chancellor of Germany, the Social Democratic Chancellor of Germany, went to Poland in 1970 and fell on his knees at the Warsaw Ghetto to apologize for the, the massacre of the, of the Polish Jews in that ghetto. It was an amazing moment because Willy Brandt, a social democrat, he and his ilk were themselves persecuted by the Nazis. He had not a taint of the guilt that the Nazis should have felt and the Germans who supported the Nazis would have felt. He had been an opponent. But as the head of the German government, he felt it was his obligation to convey that apology in Poland for what had gone wrong. On his knees, okay? Second example, a more recent one from this year, when the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, apologized in the Canadian Parliament to India on the centenary of the Komagata Maru incident. 
Komagata Maru was a Japanese ship on which a lot of Indian immigrants, mainly Sikhs, and many of them fleeing the British because they've been associated with, with nationalist movements and some of them. They were turned away from Vancouver only because they were Indian, and many of them were killed by the British when they came back. And Trudeau apologized, saying this was a wrong done to Indians by Canada. Now, here are two concrete examples of real apologies. What I said, and I have said in interviews, I don't know if I've said it in the book, is that it would be great if on the centenary of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, which was a single worst atrocity and one that was emblematic of everything that was wrong about British rule, because not only was it this horrendous killing of unarmed innocents without provocation, but the racism that accompanied it, Indians being forced to crawl on their bellies down that street in Amritsar, and then the British celebration of these killings, the attempted exoneration by the official commission of inquiry, the collection of funds for Dyer by the British, Rudyard Kipling and the Daily Telegraph calling him the savior of India, Dyer, the savior of India. This kind of thing, it encapsulated in one sort of microcosm everything that was wrong about British rule in India. So I've said in a centenary year, which would be 1919, if a British, a symbol of the British state, ideally the prime minister or a member of the royal family, could fall on their knees in Jallianwala Bagh and say, forgive us for the wrongs we have done, that would cleanse 200 years of the stain. Um, Angad Singh wants to know whether the Dakota Access Pipeline controversy uh, compares to what the British did to India. Sorry, the what? I, I missed yeah, this. Actually, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Okay, Angad, that exceeds even this polymath's knowledge, so we'll <laughs> skip that one. <laughs> you know? okay, uh, catch uh, me as I get off the stage and tell me what it is I'd love to learn. <laughs> Um, Anup Nair says, I applaud you as a true BJP member. Your treatise... <laughs> Sorry, wrong number. <laughs> Your treatise on what India was 2,000 years ago is what the BJP has been saying all along. Want to consider changing parties? No, but I explained already, maybe before you typed your question on this thing, that, that there are fundamental areas of disagreement because they don't take as, as broad a view of what I celebrate about India. And that's the pity of it. I think that in many ways, the BJP could have appealed to all Indians because I believe that every person in this civilization who has immersed their life, their soil, their genes, their blood in this country has as much right to claim that heritage. I see no problem with a Parsi whose ancestors came to Gujarat in the seventh century. Um, a Christian, perhaps a Kerala Christian who was converted to Christianity before any Brit had ever seen the Christian light, um, also saying that they're proud of some of the accomplishments of ancient India uh, or of the civilizational attainments, because these are all our collective forebears. To my mind, the BJP's flaw is that they deny their version of India to everyone who's not like them. Um, Rajat... Rajat has an interesting question, Shashi, in fact, I'd like to know that, is that what is your source uh, when you contend that land belonged to the t tiller before the British came? So there's an awful lot of scholarship on all of this stuff. And in fact, uh, I, I have to confess that there are about oof, 269, I think, footnotes and references, endnotes and references at the end of the book, because I knew precisely that I was going to make arguments that people would want to cross-check. So everything is there. Uh, what I, I, I looked at, not only documents from the period, which was a lot of fun, because thanks to modern risk, I couldn't, it would not have, it would have taken me years of going from library to library just, you know, a decade ago. But today, thanks to modern technology, everything is available. Uh, and I have read entire books written in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries uh, about the period the people who were writing were actually writing about. So it's absolutely fabulous, and you can you know, get them all in a few bits and bytes on your, on your, on your drive today. Um, I have also read documents of that period, House of Commons testimony, so, because as you said, there was that critical spirit and they did. And I have also read some of the recent contemporary scholarship. So you're saying and the this land belonged to the tillers? Agrarian policies. Now, of course, India was a patchwork. So when you read scholarship, it is usually geographically confined. And I've said in my preface already, that I, there may well be things here that I'm unaware of, I haven't come across in my research. So it's impossible to say that everywhere in India this was the case. 
but in a lot of places that have been studied in detail, which are basically the places where the British ruled, and starting with the East India Company, Bengal in particular, I mean the old Bengal, which included Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, all of that. In the, that area, the Bengal presidency of, of the British, certainly uh, land belonged essentially to the tiller. Or rather, belonging or ownership in the British sense was not a big deal. There were no written documents saying this. But it was understood that the tiller's unquestioned rights over the land he tilled were there, and that the, rent, the, 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 the big landlord was actually the rent collector. He had no particular claim over that. Under the British, who only were familiar with the squirearchy of the British home counties in the Midlands, they wanted to create landowners and landholders who would then be accountable not only for revenue, but for keeping the peace in those areas and being accountable to the, to the British overlords. So it was a replication of a system that had not existed in India. Okay. I'll end with this question because it uh, kind of sums up why we are looking at history. Niharika Kalia would like to know whether children should be learning present texts and focusing on the future, and hasn't there been too much focus on the past? This why is, is this a very, important? very important question, and I am very glad somebody asked it. Um, you know, I had an argument once with the late Shimon Peres, the late president of Israel, who told me precisely this. He said, I don't want my grandson to study history. And I said, why not? I love history. And he said, history only teaches you to, to hate. To survive in today's world, you must be able to forget. I want my grandson to focus on the future. That was his message. And I argued with him about it, but he made me think. It was something that I really, really had, had an opportunity to think about. Um, and I think with the greatest respect to the grand old man, that he was wrong. Because if you don't know where you're coming from, how will you appreciate where you're going? If you can't grasp the past both for itself and for what it points to in your present and your future, you're missing, it's like not knowing who your father or your grandfather was. You ask any child who has somehow not had that knowledge, they feel deprived. There is a depth, a profundity of a consciousness of who you are that comes from the knowledge of who your forebears were, and that's true of a country as well as it is of an individual. Equally, the point about history is, as I said, not about seeking revenge. I really, to my mind today, I have no desire to revenge myself upon the British. They, our relationship with Britain today is one of two sovereign equals. You know, we, we, are, we are both states. In fact, our economy is actually slightly larger than theirs, and we're doing reasonably well, thank you. And we're beating them at cricket often enough. So as far as <laughs> cricket, by the way, I quote Ashish Nandi's classic line, you know, because that is something else I concede the British brought to India. Uh, but I do say that, as Ashish Nandi put it memorably, cricket is an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. <laughs> That's another matter. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, I don't think that you should use history for the wrong purposes. Um, I disagree with using history as a club to bludgeon people with, whether they're foreigners or some of your own people you don't agree with. I want history to be a source of enlightenment, of profound awareness and appreciation of who you are, where you've come from. And then I want us to also focus on the future. I, the last sentence in the book is sometimes the best crystal ball is a rear view mirror. Look back on the past, nowhere where the road is behind you, and then drive forward, but focus your eyes on the front and not just on the rear view mirror. Thank you very much, you've been a great audience. Thank you, Shashi. That was absolutely riveting and a timely reminder for why we must be a little wary of charisma and be very, very attracted to real knowledge. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. So beware of Shoma, she's really a charismatic <laughs> founder of this institution. Well done, Shoma. Thank you, Shashi. And look forward to seeing all of you on the 11th. And Shashi's books are out there for sale, and if you want to have them signed. And thank you very, very much for making a weekday so memorable. Thank you.